Hello, Jim. Welcome, so, welcome to the show. I'm so glad to have you here. I, I, are, are those books behind you? Did you read all those books? A lot of them. I have a few more bookcases as well. I've been reading for uh, yeah, a long time. Okay, I like that. I like to see people who read because uh, I believe a lot of the problems in the world that relate to people who don't read anymore. <laughs> I, do, I do as well. And, and my generation doesn't like to hear that at all. I know. Well, it's sad because, I mean, the level of ignorance today, you don't see it. I mean, you're, you look like you're a young guy, but I mean, uh, years ago, people read much more. And let me put it this way. I, I just said something on Facebook. I, I, I said, 20 years ago, you couldn't have had a president like Don, Donald Trump and you couldn't have had a celebrity like Kim Kardashian because neither one of them would have been accepted by the public. But because of the ignorance and stupidity that have evolved from, let's say, lack of reading and educating, self-education, mm -hmm. these have become celebrities. One of them is the president. Never would have happened. I come from New York, and I can tell you that Donald Trump, growing up in New York, was always considered a clown. Every New Yorker never took him seriously. Well, even myself, when I went to I went to business school at Carnegie Mellon for my undergrad, and uh, at the time I tried to read some of his books, The Art of the Deal, and stuff like that. They were they were actually trash books, really. They were, I, I, I you know. But the the thing is, actually, I feel like there's two things going on, and not to get too much off topic, but there's there's a degradation of the American work ethic, and there's a there's this intellectual debasement that's occurring. Come on, you know, it's. I don't know how much social media has to do with that, but I feel like it has a lot to do with it. I think, I think it definitely social media is involved because people are spending more time on social media, on Instagram and Facebook, and they're not educated, they're not reading. And, and, uh, and the problem is you could write anything on Facebook. Everybody's an expert, you know what I mean? Anybody can express their opinion. And uh, an intelligent person, if he sees a statement that seems outrageous, will try to verify it. That's the way a scientific mind works. But most people, unfortunately, take it as face value. Uh, one of my favorites I remember was when uh, the last presidential election, somebody put that, uh, wrote about um, Hillary Clinton was operating a child uh, porn ring out of a pizza shop. And people just believed it right off that. Nobody, I mean, did, did, I, I saw that, I said that immediately, how ridiculous that is. I didn't accept it for even a nanosecond. And all these people are accepting that. I mean, this is what I'm talking about. You know, well, I mean, have you heard of the Q? I just came across this yesterday, actually. Have you heard of the Q conspiracy, the Q Anon conspiracy? No, what is that? There's, there's a conspiracy that has a pretty big following right now, apparently, that basically the world leaders have joined together in a pedophile ring and there is, they worship Satan. And there's no, go to Wikipedia, it's called Q Anon. It's really widely believed. Yeah. Look, obviously, the, it doesn't help when um, I forgot that gentleman's name who was jailed and then died in mysterious circumstances. It doesn't help when you the wealthy guy. Yeah, I know yeah, he... yeah. Well, it doesn't help when that happens. That gives some credibility to these outlandish conspiracy yeah. theories. But yes. you're right. There's a paucity of uh, of interest in reading, and people just spend time looking at pictures all day, which is something. I mean, only really we used to do that. Fans of bodybuilding, we used to look at all the pictures, but people go way overboard right now. They do something. Well, yes, that's, that's what children do. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> you know, most children, uh, with her exceptions, they're not big readers, but they love pictures. This I is mean, true. I mean, I hate to say it, but what you're talking about is basically an infantile mind. And that, again, this is what causes a lot of the problems. They're very immature, infantile. They don't think. They don't think things through. And, uh, again, I attribute a, a, a vast majority of that to basically intellectual ignorance from a lack of reading. People just don't read anymore. A lot of people don't read, you know? Which is interesting because schooling, higher levels of schooling, college has become almost necessary for everyone to go through now. And yet this is going on at the same time, which shows you the questionable value really of those undergraduate degrees. And, you know, okay. Okay. the purpose of it was, anyway, I don't want to go too much off top. I, I have so many, so just to introduce Jerry to the audience, because some of the audience don't uh, follow bodybuilding, I want them to know more about you. Jerry has over 50 years of experience in the bodybuilding community, over half a century. Really, I think that Jerry is quite deserving of a kind of lifetime achievement award in the, or Hall of Fame kind of thing in the bodybuilding world. He trained as a competitive bodybuilder in the 70s. He trained with people such as Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was at Gold's Gym, went at the heyday of Gold's Gym. But moreover, more, more than that, he is the most well-known writer in the bodybuilding world on fitness, nutrition, supplements in history. 
And at the moment, just for, so you guys know, if you want to read more about him, he has a newsletter that's fantastic called Applied Metabolics. It's on AppliedMetabolics.com, I think, if I'm correct. And he writes excellent, usually about four or five long, but very easy to read articles every month on useful subjects that would be useful for people that are interested in fitness, supplements, and nutrition. Cool. So that's an introduction. Now, Jerry, as Jerry knows, and by the way, that question list I sent you was a short version. Obviously, someone, if you were on the Joe Rogan show, the interview could be five hours long. But I sent him quite a few questions. He said, this is this. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you a couple of questions on a variety of subjects, uh, like on five subjects or so. And let's start with the first thing, because I do have some great uh, fans of bodybuilding on my channel. And what I wanted to ask you about is this, since we're talking about the subject of uh, being cerebral or not, what I notice among modern bodybuilders is, and I've had the fortune to meet a few still living in, in Los Angeles and going to goals myself, is that they don't come across as cerebral or as sophisticated as the bodybuilders of the 70s did. And what I wanted to ask you is who was, who were the people that were sophisticated that you met in the 70s? Uh, well, there was, well there's quite, there was quite a few of them. I mean, for example, Mike Bencer, you know, if you're familiar with him, he was very cerebral. I mean, he loved to read. He was a big fan of of uh, of, the, of, of that philosopher. I uh, can't remember her name. Oh God, she wrote the Fountainhead and ran. I oh, mean, he was a big follower of her, and uh, and and he was he was a fairly intellectual guy. I've met a lot of MDs over the years who uh, some of them were competitive bodybuilders. I mean, the idea that every bodybuilder is a moron is not necessarily true. I mean, uh, of course, you know, in any type of activity, you're going to have people that are a little bit more intellectual than others, and same with bodybuilding. Mm. So, you know, there was, a, I remember there was a guy back in the 70s who was an MD, C.F. Smith, was competing in the Misty, uh, USA Bodybuilding Championship. There was a guy named Craig Whitehead, who was a uh, ophthalmologist, uh, an MD. Uh, a friend of mine was uh, John, uh, uh, John Gorgit, who was also a, uh, a ophthalmologist, um, who actually they used his body in the, in the very famous textbook, textbook Gray's Anatomy, which is the number one textbook in the world. Really? Yeah, of course. For him to show surface anatomy, in other words, to show to show the muscles, because he was a bodybuilder and an MD and, a, and an Olympic weightlifter. What so, an honor! So these guys, these guys are, uh, and I'll never forget. You know, speaking of John Gorgon, he passed away a couple of years ago, a complication of surgery, but. John Gorg and I, we were once sitting in a restaurant and he, he just happened to, out of nowhere, he said to me, Jerry, he said, you know, there are some people that are so evil that they don't deserve to live. And I, and I was stunned because here, here's a medical doctor saying that. I, and I didn't comment on it, but I always remembered that in the, inter, in the, in the, in the intervening years when you, know, you see people like terrorists and all that kind of stuff. And I, I always sort of, John, every time I see that kind of thing, where people do very evil things, I always think of John Gorgit's words and how they really don't deserve to live some people. I mean, you know. You know, I've spent a lot of time actually reading books about criminals for some reason. And I, 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 I'm of the opinion that there is such a thing as human evil. Okay. It is a real thing. There are people that are truly evil. Oh, yeah. It's true. I, would, I would direct any listeners to a biography of Charles Panzram. He's a, a rapist and murderer from the 1930s. If you read that guy's autobiography, you will believe in real evil. Well, you have, you have the psychopaths, uh, which is an interesting category because psychopaths can go can take one of two roads. If you're familiar with psych psychopathy, uh, they, <laughs> because of their lack of conscious and and complete uh, disregard of, of any human emotion, basically, they have problems with the wiring in their brain related to the amygdala. Uh, and they're fearless, you know? and the thing is, if you use that in a positive direction, for example, business. You can become quite successful. You can become a CEO. They, I know it sounds funny. They've done studies. A large majority of big time CEOs are clinical psychopaths. But instead of going into crime, they directed their complete lack of empathy into business success. They'll step over and crush anybody, whereas a normal person would kind of hesitate. I can't do that to people. I can't lay off 40,000 people. I can't do it. They don't think like that. They have no, they sleep, they have no conscience at all. And then the other road, of course, is crime, where, you know, a, 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 a criminal psychopath could cut your head off and walk away and not think twice about it. So True, yeah. your, your comment on the amygdala is so accurate as well, because there was a famous case, I think, in the 50s or 40s of a serial killer who was a normal gentleman, developed a tumor on his amygdala. 
and began to be, I forgot his name. And also it's an interesting side note that the few studies on the effects of anabolic steroids on the brain have shown a disconnect forming between the amygdala and other parts of the brain. Very interesting side note. I wanted to ask, just because you said something uh, about the MDs, I noticed that I, th I feel like you were originally planning to be an MD yourself. That's true. Yeah. Uh, I was in med in college. I had planned to be an MD, and I, I, uh, I kind of throw Arnold in the story. I'll tell you what happened was when I was in college, uh, well, just as it is today, it was even harder back then to get into medical school. You had to have straight A's. You had to have a very high grade point average. You had to have very high scores on a test called the Medical College Admission, Admission Test. None of that dissuaded me, but uh, what, what did was the fact that when I was ready to go to med school, they had something called affirmative action, where they would uh, they would allow minorities to get into med school with uh, basically what would be the equivalent of a C average. Mm. It was barely passable. A mm. guy like had to have straight A's, and and the competition was so intense. I mean, I'd read these books and I'd see, I, I attended uh, seminars and conferences where they talk about how, how, how the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the possibility of being accepted for medical school was infinitesimal, slim, and it discouraged me. And I said to myself, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do something else. Now, I always talk about Arnold because Arnold was the kind of guy, and I know personally enough to say this, where no matter how many uh, things against doing something you could show him, it had no effect on him. It wouldn't dissuade him in any way. Like, for example, I myself tried to tell him that, you know, trying to go into show business might be a waste of time for him because he was too big. He had the accent. It didn't affect him at all. He just went straight ahead. Now, if I had had that mindset, I probably would have been an MD, but I let myself get discouraged. So my message to people is forget the odds. Instead, the best way to look at it, which I didn't at the time, was hey, somebody's getting into med school, I can too. That's the proper attitude. In other words, if nobody's getting into med school, that's a different, then you have a reason to be discouraged. That's you, you have people, uh, and you know, I knew some of these people, they weren't any smarter than I were. You know, they, they just didn't let themselves get discouraged. So in retrospect, though, I have to be honest, uh, over the years, I, 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 I haven't really been that upset about not becoming a doctor because I know a lot of doctors uh, a large majority of them don't like being doctors because of all the red tape involved, the insurance and all that. A lot of them aren't happy and this and that. So I don't really regret it. Uh, the, the one thing I regret is it would have given me a solid profession. Uh, I, I've jumped around with different jobs over the years. It would have been nice to have a steady income, you know, where I could, you know, have a family, buy a house and live a normal life. That would have been nice, but it didn't happen. So, you know, you don't live in the past. You just have to live in the present and the future. So I, I don't... That's hilarious. I think just like you, I'm a naturally slightly a pessimist. I see myself as a realist, but my wife sees it as pessimism and my wife has that kind of can-do attitude. So it's good that we have each other because we balance each other out. Yeah, and yeah. I, yeah, I agree. I'll ask you another thing also that you mentioned. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to ask you, where are you, where are you living now? Where are you calling? I live in Los Angeles in Sherman Oaks. Oh, you're right. I thought you were. I'm thinking you might, maybe you're in London somewhere. I, no, I, I used to live in London. Yes, actually, I'm I'm a binational, so I'm American as well as uh, from another country. So I have two citizenships, which is why I have uh, the accent. I'm, my mother's my mother's from the U.S. and my father's from abroad. Got it. Okay, go ahead. So, so I was going to ask you, um, Mike Menzer. You mentioned he was very intelligent, and I have to go through more things. But I just wanted to, to question because I've always been a bit personally like uh, sad. I don't know him obviously but I was saddened to see it, the, the end of his life didn't seem to go well as well as he would have liked do you know the root causes of that uh, psychologically did you know him well enough to comment on that he was very frustrated uh, you know about a lot of things in his life uh, also he uh, he inherited uh, his mother had suffered from clinical depression and unfortunately Mike inherited that so he had a tendency towards depression and uh, the strange thing about Mike was at the time of his death, he was actually doing very well from a, uh, let's say, from a uh, commercial perspective. He was doing phone consults. I remember him telling me that he was making an average of six to $8,000 a week from just phone consults. He was wow. 24 hours a day. He had his books he was selling. He was training people. In other words, his life was going well, uh, but I, I don't think he killed himself or anything like that. I think that it was just a, uh, uh, what do they call it, like a perfect storm of drug use. He had uh, the uh, autopsy report, which I, I received, actually, 
or I got a hole up. It showed several drugs in the system, about two different kinds of antidepressants. Uh, he had uh, uh, anti-anxiolytics, in other words, for, for anxiety. Yeah. Uh, and to top it all, he had severe atherosclerosis because, uh, and that was the immediate cause of his death because Mike, unfortunately, uh, did not have good health habits. He was a, a chain smoker. Yeah. He cigarettes a lot, and he let himself get completely out of shape. He was so, kind of, uh, I wouldn't call him obese. He was, for Mike Menzer, he was fat. But, yeah. you know, and the average person, he was still in better shape. He had mm -hmm. he had a gut on him, in other words. He had but, like a metabolic syndrome look. Kind of, exactly, exactly. That would be right. In fact, I, he probably did have the metabolic syndrome. But the thing about Mike was he, uh, uh, you know, he didn't take care of himself. And that's, I think, what caused his death. He, it wasn't a question of that he wanted to die or anything like that. He had severe, uh, I looked at the autopsy, severe arterial sclerosis. He, he needed a trans, uh, not a trans, a... Uh, a stent or a, what do they call that? Bypass. Yeah. Bypass. And I guess uh, he didn't realize it and he died. You know, more mysterious was what caused his brother's death, Ray, who's, who mysterious. I mean, he was basically taking care of Ray because between the two of them, Ray was clearly in worse shape than Mike. Ray had something called Bright's disease, which is a form of kidney failure. Also mm -hmm. a heavy smoker, also out of shape, hadn't trained in years. And, and when I saw Ray right before he died, I was shocked because he could barely walk. He was shuffling. This was a very strong guy when I knew him as a bodybuilder. And here he was walking bent over and shuffling like an old man. I was shocked when I saw him. So Ray, I think, uh, you know, I'm not sure whether he killed himself. Nobody ever really knew. Or maybe just the shock of uh, Mike's death. Just, you know, he was, again, he, this guy was teetering on the edge of death himself. Kind of pushed him over the edge because he only died two days later. Died two, oh, days. Two, two days. Wow. Two days after Mike died. Yeah. Fascinating. I re may they rest in peace. Uh, actually, on this topic, uh, I, I've always been curious about something. You know, I uh, sometimes I talk a little bit about the thing. What I notice among modern bodybuilders is that, and and most of the people I'm talking about are not famous, not professionals. But there's a lot of uh, what we'd call like um, you know gym goers who are steroid aficionados who are dying in their 20s and early 30s, which I believe, but I of course don't have experience to say, was uncommon in the 70s or or even early 80s. And what I wanted to ask about is how did a lot of these 70s or even 60s or 50s bodybuilders that you may have known in the 70s, how did most of them pass away, and what age do they usually pass away? Well, some of them are still alive, like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Exactly, yeah. 72. I mean, we can go on with some more. And more. That's why I was saying maybe 50s and 60s as well. Yeah, I mean, most of them uh, uh, die of just uh, natural causes. I mean, there's no premature. Uh, unfortunately, most of them don't live extended lives. Uh, and I, I, there's, there's, there's actually clinical reasons for that that nobody ever talks about. In fact, I tried to write an article about that for a bodybuilding magazine called Iron Man years ago, and it was rejected because it was such, a, they considered such a negative article. That it would, but it was scientifically true. In other words, my article, if, I don't know if you're familiar with, with some of the biochemistry, it's centered around stimulating mammalian target of rapamycin. mTOR. They call it now mechanistic target of rapamycin. Or they changed it. I noticed that, yeah. Right. right. And, and my, my theory at the time, we're going back, this is like 20 years ago, before anyone ever said this. I just looked at the pathways and, and I, I noticed that uh, as in animals, when mTOR goes up with age, there's an imbalance between mTOR and another substance called uh, AMPK. Uh, and when, when mTOR goes up, it seems to stimulate aging processes in the cell. It seems to sim stimulate cardiovascular disease and cancer, which were the two uh, major killers. So my article, which was strictly hypothetical at the time, I theorized that unless bodybuilders do something to offset the, the increase, and, and remember, bodybuilders do things to stimulate mTOR much more than normal. They take leucine, amino acids, they exercise, high protein. All these things stimulate mTOR. And the mTOR goes up anyway with age. And my theory was that bodybuilders were going to prematurely die because of this constant stimulation of mTOR. And I suggested at the time, I really wasn't sure. I only knew at the time that exercise would stimulate AMPK. So mm -hmm. my article suggested that uh, bodybuilders always ensure they do aerobics because a lot of us don't like to do any kind of, a, you know, they think it uh, reduces muscle size, prevents muscle gain. And I knew even then that aerobics do, does stimulate AMPK. What I didn't know at the time, but found out later, was there's a drug called metformin, 
which also stimulates AMPK and can also actually block the mTOR effect. It can completely, you know, in other words, if you balance out metformin with exercise and protein intake, you don't have to suffer the consequences of elevated mTOR with age. So, uh, so basically, I, well, to make a long story short, I think that the bodybuilders today, because of the addition of drugs that were not common years ago, such as insulin and uh, an addition and huge amounts of growth hormone uh, and, and much greater steroid use, uh, I would be very surprised if these guys made it to even Arnold's age, even the 70s. I'd be very, you know, the only hope they have, well, I was going to say the only hope they have is, is to retire and get off the drugs. Unfortunately for them, the more recent studies show that uh, con consistently, going on, on, consistently going on high dose steroid cycles and getting off like they do, you know, they go on huge amounts of steroids and drugs before a contest, then get off, hopefully allow their body to regenerate. Unfortunately, doing this year after year causes structural changes in the heart, which predispose them to congestive heart failure past a certain age. So a lot of these guys, I, and I hope I'm wrong, and they also have increased calcium deposits in the coronary arteries. Uh, there was a study shown where they, uh, uh, they actually tested 14 uh, professional bodybuilders, and 12 of them showed increased coronary car calcium artery scores Yet only, yet none of them at the time had any cardiac symptoms. They had no symptoms, but they already were laying down a pretty good amount of calcium in the heart. That doesn't, for that doesn't uh, uh, bode well. Bode well. That's the way exactly what I was looking for. That doesn't bode well for future heart health or longevity. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. Jerry, I love what you just said, and my audience will really relate to it. I I call this the growth longevity trade off. The trade off between the nutrient sensing. AMP kinase pathway and the mTOR, which is the major growth pathway of the body. But you did this too. You talked about this, I guess, two decades before anyone was really talking about it, which is unbelievable. Uh, Actually, the article was never published because, I, I mean, looking back, I guess you would call it a negative. I was basically saying if you engage in bodybuilding, exactly. even if you don't eat steroids, if you engage in bodybuilding, eat a lot of protein, eventually it's going gonna, it's gonna to short circuit your longevity. You're going to probably exactly. die much younger than didn't do that and you know they you know, because it was a bodybuilding magazine they thought it was inappropriate and it was never used but i, I know, you know somehow funny, i know that feeling you know the funny thing is now you see this everywhere a lot of people are talking about the effects of that what nobody talked about it back then the reason is i guess this we'll, we'll talk about it later the longevity stuff which i know you've talked about on your channel as well we'll talk about it a bit but uh just for the viewers to know that the protein consumption directly uh, stimulates mTOR and then the mTOR turns off autophagy and there's also more concerns i mean uh jerry mentioned leucine which is such a big concern because it's the most potent amino acid to turn on mTOR and of course bodybuilders will try to get branched chain amino acids that will have a higher percentage of leucine because they know it turns on mTOR and mTOR is the growth pathway. But then nowadays, they well, also we have other concerns with protein. And by the way, Jerry, there was a wonderful article in The Lancet in 2019 that was like a hit piece on protein for longevity. It talked about uh, the effect of methionine on SAM as well as um, you know, mTOR, all that. But um, what I was going to say is that now the bodybuilders are using, uh, trying to stimulate IGF-1, which is downstream to mTOR, as much as they can. And I believe it may be even upstream to mTOR somehow. They may have interconnected links. So, so they're using uh, HGH and insulin, which are growth um, uh, hormones in the body, as well as uh, uh, turning on mTOR through protein, as well as I believe that the androgens may also turn on mTOR somehow. Just because of the state, yeah, you think so? It's shown. The testosterone directly stimulates mTOR, yeah. Oh, fantastic. You mentioned autophagy. Maybe we should explain to a lot of people who might be listening to this what autophagy is. Basically, it's a clearing out of bad old cells, senescent cells. They now know probably, the, it, it's come to the fore where it's probably the leading theory of aging now is, has, has to do with an accumulation of senescent cells, meaning cells replicate up to a certain point. <laughs> And the tel telomeres at the end of the cells, when they get short enough and when they basically disappear, the cell goes into a state of senescence where it's not reproducing. However, it is secreting various inflammatory factors, which lead to systemic inflammation, which causes the loss of muscle, the loss of cardiac function, the loss of lung function, the loss of brain function, and then you're dead. You know, one thing leads to another. Now, an interesting fact that a lot of people don't realize, the main number one benefit 
You hear a lot about intermittent fasting. The main benefit of intermittent fasting by far is that it stimulates autophagy. It stimulates autophagy. A lot of people overlook, they think, well, it helps weight loss and it does this. The truth of the matter is that in, in direct studies, you've probably seen them too, when they've compared just regular dieting to intermittent fasting, the, uh, uh, the weight loss is about the same. Intermittent fasting is not superior to normal dieting for fat loss or weight loss. However, intermittent dieting does offer a huge advantage in that it stimulates autophagy and it basically neutralizes like the mTOR effect. And it, in other words, it stimulates the sirtuins, which are longevity genes, as you know. I mean, you know, so it really has some good things. Uh, if you can handle it, it, it's very good for you. But uh, again, I would say by far, if you said to me, what is the real uh, benefit of intermittent fasting? One word, autophagy, by far. I agree. And, and now we have, um, uh, Jerry mentioned uh, metformin, which I assume Jerry takes, which is uh, fantastic. And I take metformin as well, although I take it prophylactically, sort of. Uh, but I take it for two reasons, because uh, I actually started to take it because I, I'm pre-diabetic through genetics. Yeah. Uh, both sides of my family, my father died of di uh, diabetic complications. So I've been taking uh, metformin uh, because I'm uh, uh, insulin resistant for many years. It wasn't until a couple of years ago, though, that all this longevity stuff came out. And I said to myself, you know, even if I don't have any pre-diabetes symptoms, I'm staying on metformin just exactly. for the stuff alone. Because exactly. I'm not gonna say it. it kind of neutralizes the mTOR effect, stimulates AMPK, and it does. I, I, I'm going to do a uh, article on some of the anti-aging, some of the really interesting effects they found lately with mTOR, uh, with uh, metformin. It's very interesting. Uh, but if more people knew about it, they'd probably want to get at. It. And I just want to add real fast, so I don't forget. Uh, if you study the medical literature. There was, there was a study that came out which got, went on a lot of websites, uh, a lot of websites discussed it, where it would say that it said that MET4 interferes with exercise induced gains, uh, just like antioxidants do. If you take MET4, the, the study said, you would, uh, it would neutralize you know, anabolic signaling, uh, induction of new mitochondria, mitochondria biogenesis. Well, mm -hmm. it turned out that that study was extremely flawed. Uh, and it was based on something that doesn't, it was a basically looking at it from an in vitro perspective. Mm -hmm. In other words, what, happened, uh, what happens in the body with metformin in relation to exercise does not happen. In other words, the main problem with metformin is, is they now know that the actual mechanism uh, of how, how it stimulates APK is through a, a interference with a certain, uh, let's say, element in mitochondria. It kind of short circuits it. So it interferes with mitochondrial function, and by doing so, the body compensates by stimulating AMPK. That's how metformin works. So the theory was, in this study, because it interferes with my, mitochondrial function, and because mitochondrial biogenesis through beat PGC1A is so important for health and fitness and fat burning and, and everything, that you know metformin must be bad. But it turns out the body, this is what they didn't know, a follow-up study, which I'm going to be writing about, showed that the body compensates. In other words, it, yes, it doesn't interfere with, a metformin doesn't interfere with mitochondrial function, but the body compensates when you do the exercise. So in the long run, the, the, uh, the, uh, there is no net negative effect taking metformin with exercise. That's the bottom line. That's very fascinating. I haven't actually read that paper. That, thank you so much for telling me about that. I want to... Go, do a Google search just right. Metformin and exercise, and the paper will turn up right away. You'll see. It. Interesting. Another thing. Well, we could say there's one slightly negative effect of metformin for athletes, which is an increase in lactic acid. Yes. There's, there's also that's the reason they caution sometimes people with kidney issues uh, of the fear of lactic acidosis, which is very rare. Yes. But but I do notice it raises lactic acid slightly in most people that that have tested themselves. Well, you know, there was a drug before metformin uh, called fet fenformin. And the, oh, they were, that drug was removed because it caused a lot of lactic acidosis. So you could say metformin is an improved version, but what you said is accurate. In other words, a lot of it has to do with, uh, in, in pharmacology, it's always time and dosage. In other words, how long you take a drug, how much you take, particularly how much. And then you have the hormetic effect, meaning that something could be beneficial at small amounts and they can negative past a certain point. Now that applies to metformin too. And what you're saying is accurate. Uh, people with kidney problems or let's say uh, incipient 
or, or, or let's say kidney disease they might not be aware of, uh, they have a much greater chance, it's true, of getting lactic acidosis with metformin. Uh, and there is another uh, bad thing about metformin that you did mention, that taking uh, more than two grams a day, that's 2,000 milligrams, and uh, the only people that would take that much, to my knowledge, are, di are people with really bad diabetes. I've never taken that much. It will start to interfere with testosterone synthesis too. If you get over two grams a day, it'll interfere with testosterone. Again, again, anything below that, there's no interference. A lot of people in the longevity community take two grams, including myself, by yeah. the way. <laughs> it's over two grams. In other words, two grams is, is the limit of yeah. saying, if you take 2,500, that's when you're going to have a, and, and it's not a major thing. It's a minor, it's a minor effect, yeah. I don't want people to think that if you take 2,500 milligrams of, of uh, metformin, your testosterone is going to turn off like a water faucet. No, it'll just a slight interference. And per people that are working out and doing everything right, you won't even notice anything. I just uh, it to, uh, to be complete. Another thing you mentioned is regarding uh, intermittent fasting and uh, the fat loss. I, I noticed, of course, what you say is correct, is that the fat loss is quite similar, which makes sense. But the interesting thing is there are some studies that show a greater a difference in proportion of the fat loss between uh, subcutaneous fat and visceral fat, right. which is, I think, it must be somewhat, it must indicate that intermittent fasting is somewhat better for metabolic health other than all these longevity pathways just because the visceral fat is more inflammatory. That's very Visceral fat is by far, and visceral fat, in case again, people don't know, is the fat, internal, deep internal fat around your organs that you can't see. It's uh, usually in the gut area. Visceral fat is very labile because it's always uh, breaking down. It's always releasing fatty acids, which travel to the liver and where the fatty acids are, uh, can you know, be converted into uh, uh, certain types of negative cholesterol, like low density. Uh, visceral fat is associated with insulin resistance, associated with diabetes, associated with cancer. It's very bad for you. Uh, however, subcutaneous fat is considered actually, I mean, from an aesthetic point of view, it doesn't look good. This is the fat that, for example, obscures muscle definition. It's the fat right under the skin. But anything that'll get rid of visceral fat is definitely beneficial. And, and you're right, intermittent fasting tends to focus on, on visceral fat, which is, which is a definite, definite health benefit. Because again, if you cut down visceral fat, uh, you're cutting down insulin resistance, you're cutting down cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So definitely a, uh, uh, an asset. And I th I'm not quite sure about this, but I think that the subcutaneous fat is more likely of any fat to be brown fat, uh, uh, thermically active fat that has more rich mitochondria. And so the, the subcutaneous fat tends to be more overall metabolically active than the visceral fat, but I'm not sure about that. Right. Well, the, the way it is, the way the body works is that subcutaneous fat, you can look at it as a more natural fat store. In other words, uh, you get into trouble when you have uh, a fat in areas that it's not supposed to accumulate, such as the liver, fatty mm -hmm. liver, and that type of thing. Uh, in the muscles, when you have too much intramuscular fat, which is an average in people who don't work out, not people who work out, but people who don't work out, high levels of intramuscular fat are related to definite insulin resistance. Uh, in other words, this, this, uh, there's a certain word for it, I can't remember, but the, 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 uh, the deposition of fat in areas other than subcutaneous is definitely detrimental to health, whereas subcutaneous actually, is, even though it doesn't look good, uh, is actually not bad for your health. In other words, it's, uh, because it's, it's considered that's where the body wants to store fat. Right? It's physiologically normal, yeah. Right. And, and Jerry, on this topic, another question is, so we've seen this shape of bodybuilders change since, uh, since the, and by the way, recently my wife, my wife always, she says to me, she sees the bodybuilders that, that I'm talking about on my videos and she says, These, they look, why do people do this? But then I showed her recently some of the 70s bodybuilders to try to explain why we all got interested in bodybuilding when we we're in our youth. And she said, wow, these are incredible. This is completely different. And this is obviously something that happens a lot in society. Now, people don't realize what bodybuilders look like before. And I'm going to include a picture of you, that black and black and white picture of you with the palm trees behind you to show what a, what a physique used to look like. I wanted to comment on the change in the shape of the physiques. Of course, we could say there's a, a drug use change or eating change, all these kind of different things. But I wonder physically, what is the anatomical difference? And what I think personally is a personal theory is the deposition of fat, intramuscular fat, 
because I noticed that the glutes and the legs seem to get much bigger than other muscles do. Their arms don't seem to get that much bigger and their fat would be more likely to be stored in intramuscularly in the glutes, for example. And I also think that their distended abdomens, uh, a lot of it has to do with um, uh, fatty liver as well as visceral fat on the other organs and in between the organs. What do you think about that? No, everything you said makes sense. It, it, it's, it's probably true, uh, uh, but nobody's actually measured this. That's the yeah. problem. Uh, everything you say in that regard, for example, the distended abdomens, you know, let's say the increased uh, intramuscular fat, it makes sense from a physiological point of view. Uh, we know that in athletes and bodybuilders, when you are active, the intramuscular fat is very labeled. It's, it's actually being used for exercise, and it does not contribute to any negative health effects like insulin resistance. But you take that same fat in a sedentary person, it's extremely negative because it basically just sits there and, it, and it, you have an increase of these things called diglycerides, which uh, actually uh, uh, initiate insulin resistance. So, uh, you know, what you're saying is, is plausible, but it would have to be speculative, honestly. Yeah. I, I don't think anyone's ever actually measured this. So, you know, again, I, I, again, it's possible, but I honestly, to be perfectly honest, I couldn't say for sure because I don't think anyone, to my knowledge, has ever actually looked into that. But, of course, and it would be almost impossible to do so in a living bodybuilder. Okay. But uh, I wanted to actually call my show, this is just the second episode of it, I wanted to call it The Speculator, but my wife convinced me out of it. She said, this is not an attractive name, but that's really what I like to do. I like to speculate on things. Um, that it's that bad if you are going to speculate. <laughs> so another thing is that the, the other reason to think that is because the striations and the definition in the muscle has changed. And one could easily think that that may be actually fat in the muscle that's, uh, you know, preventing the striations from being as clear. Also, it could be water, obviously, but it could be fat. Anyway, uh, moving off this topic for a second, because one of the things I really want to talk to you about is, are supplements. And by the way, I want to ask you a lot of things about the heyday of uh, bodybuilding magazines, but I don't think we're going to have time for it. Hopefully, I can convince you to one, uh, one time to come on again, and I can ask you more questions about that. But for now, I wanted to ask you, so one of the things that you write about in your magazines often is the, uh, the um, uh, I'm forgetting the word for it, but he heavy metals, for example, being in supplements and uh, the, the the lack of regulation of the supplement ind industry. Do you feel that the, the FDA or some other, other government agency should be regulating supplements in terms of checking out what heavy metal metals they have in them and whether they have the ingredients that they claim they have and whether they have the doses that they claim they have of those ingredients? Theoretically, they should. Unfortunately, the FDA is extremely understaffed. Mm. So what they do is, and especially with the passage of the, uh, uh, I forget the name of it, the, you know, the Health Food Regulation Act uh, back in 92. I can't remember exactly, uh, uh, DS something or other, I can't remember. But the point is that that law uh, basically left it up to the, the responsibility for everything you just said to the companies themselves. Mm -hmm. so let's say the FDA assumes that uh, supplement companies will monitor and police their own uh, industry to the extent that the contents of a supplement, the ingredients will match what's on the label. They, in other words, they, they assume that's true. Unfortunately, because there could be a lot of money involved in some of these things, the, uh, a lot of people get greedy and they either underdose or, or uh, in some cases they don't have any of the ingredient in the supplements. And you know, so this is the situation where theoretically, uh, now the only time it comes to the fore or it becomes, let's say, public knowledge is uh, some independent worst researchers. There's a guy named Cohn out of Harvard who seems to have a proclivity. He likes to analyze. He just came out with a study where he looked at the, uh, there's a popular anabolic something called laxogen. In. I don't know if you ever heard of it. No, I haven't. Laxogen is derived from plants. It's sold as an anabolic supplement, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, he just happened to, his latest study, he analyzed uh, in the lab a, a lot of commercial uh, supplements containing this lanaxalin, uh, uh, and uh, he found that they didn't contain, uh, most of them had almost none of it in there. In other words, they were completely fraudulent. Now, that's when that kind of stuff comes to the public knowledge. It takes an indep independent researcher uh, will you know, analyze the product and release it. That's the only way the public knows because the FDA will not do that. They don't have the manpower, uh, especially with Trump, who, who's cut the budget of all federal agencies. They're, 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 they have less uh, uh, policing power now than they ever had the FDA. The only way this is ever going to come to public knowledge is, again, independent researchers. 
And there's websites that do that too. For example, there's something called Consumer Lab. And now I'm not trying to give a plug. I don't know these people. It's run by an MD, but I, I, I'm a member of that. I, I like to read their analysis. They do As am I. Yeah, they, they, you know, they analyze various, and they name names, and they tell you which ones are, are uh, you know, which ones don't match the label content. That would be a good thing. And there's another one called, I think it's called Lab Door, is it? Is it Lab Door? I can't remember. I don't know. There's another one. But I think it's called Lab Door, but the problem with Lab Door is it seems to have an association with some supplement companies, so I don't fully trust them, whereas Consumer Lab is completely independent, totally dependent on, just like, like my newsletter, dependent on subscribers. No, there's no commercial interest. And I trust them, you know, so, you know, when they, somebody who's interested, who's watching this, who really wants to know what's in the supplements, you might want to subscribe to Consumer Lab. And again, I'm not trying to uh, give them a plug, or, but they, they're the only one I know of that really does that all the time. I feel like they should be federally funded. They do a public service. I mean, it's, it's, it's because keep in mind that we're not just talking about some supplements don't, they have, most of the supplements have some active ingredient in them. Sometimes rarely you'll find more of the active ingredient than they say, like for example, vitamin C supplements, but often you'll find uh, supplements that are really underdosed. And unfortunately in the fitness and bodybuilding communities, coaches will tell their clients to take a certain supplement and they won't specify the brand and they won't check the third party. So you don't know how much you're getting. And if you're trying to, a lot of people like to use supplements to deal with blood pressure, for example, or cholesterol, they use red yeast rice and they don't check the brands. They don't know how much they're getting and how much that amount is fluctuating over time. You can't rely on those. So, and then you have supplements like, uh, I just, I did a video a while ago on uh, coca supplements that have a lot of cadmium in them, like really serious amounts of cadmium, you know? So, okay, that's one thing. Another, another thing I wanted to ask you about is, so I know you've discussed uh, briefly in some of your videos, which by the way, guys, Jerry, Jerry has a wonderful channel, lovely to listen to. He's easy to listen to, has like 20 minute videos, talks about all kinds of great subjects, but he's talked about the longevity researchers that have been coming out in the last 10 years, making large claims, the human being should live to 150. And, and by the way, just some background on this. The first time I came across this was in 2005. There was a, um, actually he's not a biologist by any means. He's actually a computer, uh, he has a PhD in some kind of computer field. Right, right. Aubrey degree exactly. <laughs> you also know about it. Okay. Did you did you hear about him? They're on the same time as well. Oh, I know. I, I know. I know everything he talks about. The his sense program. You know, where basically uh, to, to, he, he says as a, a person uh, who's already been born uh, is, is yeah. going to live to a thousand. You know. Uh, yeah. So, four. so you know, it's very interesting. Uh, but uh, I mean, Aubrey, if, but if Aubrey, look, if, but if you look at his. Uh, if you look at if you look carefully at what he says, and let me put it to you this way, if every if that could be done, basically, well, let me let me give you a comparison to make it really clear. You're probably aware there's trees that are alive today that are five thousand or or even older than that, six thousand, seven thousand years old, and they're still alive. How could that be? How could the tree still be alive? And the answer is very simple. Trees have the ability to replace all their internal organs. So imagine a human, let's say your heart is getting old or your lungs, and, so, and somehow you can completely replace them. Well, th it's like a car. When your car gets old, you bring it to the mechanic, you know, if the engine's going to the trip, you have to rebuilt or replace, the car keeps going. Same with a human. If you could replace the parts that are wearing out or worn out, you could go on and on and on, like the ever ready uh, rabbit or whatever they call it. You, know, you can just keep going on and on, but you know, and, and a lot of his theory or, or the sense program that espoused by Dubray, uh, uh, by Audrey, Aubrey Dubray, Audrey, Aubrey Dubray, Degray, 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 yeah. based on this idea of, for example, stem cells and, uh, uh, you know, uh, repairing the damage in the body. Uh, this is all plausible. It is. It's scientifically plausible. However, I don't see anybody doing it, talk, talk about doing it. Nobody's even mentioning doing it. So my problem with him is that he's talking about things that are maybe a hundred years from now, they'll be, they'll be possible, but I don't think it's going to affect anybody who's alive. It's just too soon. We don't have the technology to do a, a, a lot of what he espouses. So it's nice to talk about, but in practicality, I think it has almost no practicality. Really, I don't. I think that Aubrey, uh, you know, originally in 2005 and six, I thought that he was a bit wacky. And of course, uh, Cambridge came out or was it Oxford? No, you think Cambridge, Cambridge came out and said, you know, we have nothing to do with this guy. He keeps saying he works at Cambridge, but he's actually a lab technician. <laughs> but then 
then I started to realize, ah, thank, I don't know if he had anything to do with it because all this research was actually happening in the 90s. There was a lot of studies in the 90s on fasting. Like there was a group uh, at, uh, between USC and the UCLA that was doing a lot of research on fasting and on longevity. And then um, there was a group, uh, Leonard uh, Garente's group at, uh, at Harvard or MIT. There was a Boston group as well doing a lot of research on resveratrol and things like that. So I don't know if he pushed that to the, to the forefront of the media or got them a little bit more comfortable talking about it. But since he started talking in 2005, you know, legitimate biologists like David Sinclair and uh, Walter Longo here at USC, who I would love to interview one day, uh, people like that have come up with, you know, piecemeal additions that they say, you know, they're hoping toward working, uh, working toward. Like, for example, uh, you know, we're talking about senescent cells, which are those like um, zombie cells in the body that are old, old inflammatory, but not dying. We have, we're trying, trying to come up with drugs that are synthetics that specifically target those cells. Right. So, so are you hopeful of, of some small piecemeal additions happening during your lifetime, like metformin did? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's already steps in that direction. Don't get me wrong. What I was referring to when I talked about DeGray was the idea of living to a thousand uh, years old. But right now, there, as we speak now, there are some definite advancements. Uh, just to mention a few, you mentioned resveratrol. That's one of them. Stimulates sirtuin one, you know, and it does a number of other things that are very good. Of course, there's the uh, the NMM and the, and the nicotinic riboside, which stimulate the uh, uh, what is it called again? You remind me uh, the uh, stuff that's. Uh, okay. They also affect sirtuins, I believe. It affects the students, but they affect um, uh, NAD. NAD. Oh yes, yes. The main arbiter of energy production right. in the muscle, basically <laughs> NAD. And to put it very simply, it, it opposes senescence and it keeps cells alive. It actually stimulates telomerase activity, so it extends the life of cells. Theoretically, I mean, uh, I, I don't know how long people would live. You know, I guess it depends. There's not a lot of solid research to say. For example, if somebody takes NMN now, uh, you know, I mean, everybody follows David Sinclair. He, he makes videos. He says, I take a gram a day of NMN. So right away, people say, ah, that's the right dose. He doesn't, that's, David Sinclair himself admits it's just guesswork. He doesn't know if that's the right dose. Right? He's extrapolating it from animals, but there's no evidence that shows that that's, it might be two grams, it might be 10 grams. Nobody really knows. It's just a, a, a shot in the dark. So people say, well, David Sinclair, he, he knows what he's talking about. So I'm going to follow him. He takes a gram of resveratrol. He takes a gram of NMM. That's what I'm going to do. I've seen video after video of these so-called longevity guys. Well, not, they're not scientists. They're just, you know, they're into longevity. Well, I'm taking it because David Sinclair, so David, David Sinclair, they're always quoting him and this and that. But David Sinclair himself, when he's interviewed, he bluntly says, don't listen to me. I mean, I'm just guessing. I don't know if this is the right amount either. And this yeah. brings up an important point, which is, um, and by the way, most of the reason that people are using the NMN and the nicotinamide riboside is, is it, in the long end is for the sirtuins as well. But, uh, but the, you bring up an important point, which is that the first in any scientific endeavor, like for example, when flying got started, a lot of the first pilots died. That right. doesn't usually go well for the experimenters and people who are very excited about progress tend to experiment. And so you have some people like, and by the way, you bring up another important point, which is that the people nowadays, I, I see this a lot on YouTube, call to credibility and authority. So they use a name and they just, not only do they follow that blindly without reading any research, but they use it almost like a defense. If you argue with them, they're like, well, David said it. So uh, do you have a PhD from this school? No, then don't talk to me about it. So, but, but, but Walter Longo. I that a lot myself. A lot of people, uh, they'll write under my video, uh, you know, if I'm talking about a subject. Now, I never go around saying I'm a doctor. I never say I'm a PhD. I never have said that. And yet people write, who is this guy? What is his qualification? Does he have an MD? In other words, what they're saying is, if I don't have an MD or PhD, everything I say must be bullshit. It must be a lie, which is absurd. Anybody can educate themselves. You Let know. me tell you to the audience that that Jerry has read more research papers than probably 98% of MDs in the world. I can guarantee that. Leo, just for my newsletter, just to underscore what you're saying, I probably read, I know this sounds weird, I spend about 80% of my time reading new medical medical papers. I probably read about, I'm guessing, I'm just a figure off the top of my head, I probably read at least 500 papers a month just for my newsletter. 
to gather research. So I am very in tune with the research. And again, I'm not trying to say I know more than any MD or I do know a lot more about some MDs, uh, many MDs about nutrition, but that's not saying much because they're not trained in nutrition. You know, but related, I just want to finish a thought related to what you're saying, you know, like one of those, the progress of uh, towards, let's say aging today, I think things like NMN and resveratrol because of the fact that they do stimulate and sirtuins. I mean, what is the actual uh, reason why caloric restriction, was, which is accepted by most scientists, not so much in humans, but in animals, as the one established way to extend you, uh, uh, animal longevity or lifespan? It's the one accepted way. What is the key element? Stimulation of sirtuins when you lower caloric, uh, lower caloric restriction by an average of 30 to 35%. Now, taking that into account, if you could find other ways to do it, uh, maybe include caloric restriction if you can handle it to a certain extent. They've done studies where they tried to put people on 30% calorie and they could handle more than 12%. That seemed to be the maximum. 12, anything more than 12%, they couldn't stay on it. But there are people that do. There are yeah, people there that are. The Caloric Restriction Society. Caloric Society, I was just going to say it. And, you know, but the point is that if you look at the, the, let's say, the basis of caloric restriction, it has to do with stimulating two things autophagy and sirtuins. Now, if you could duplicate that with, so let's say, a combination of NMN or NR and resveratrol, I say yes, all things being equal, all things being equal, I think it would probably keep people healthier and extend longevity, assuming that you're, the rest of your health, it's not going to overcome bad health habits. If you smoke, if you're obese, if you don't exercise, don't think you can go get NMN and live to 90. It's not going to happen. It works with the rest of your lifestyle. That's an important thing to say. It's an important thing to know. But what I like about the, the subject of longevity is that, you know, sometimes I get some responses on my videos, uh, which, by the way, I constantly get this response that, uh, do you, where's your MD from? You don't have an MD. But, but anyway, other than that, um, what I constantly hear is sometimes people say, I, you know, I don't want to live that long. I just want to have a good life. And my, my point is always that you're not going to live longer unless you live healthier. Like you live more vibrant. You're going to feel better because you're aging slower. That's, that's, that's the important, that's a good point because, you know, I, I think most people agree that it's pointless to live a long time if you're kind of messed up, if you're like, you can't walk, if you're, you're you know, not ambulatory. If you're weak, if you're frail, if you have sarcopenic, you know, loss of muscle, where you, you loss of, of cognition, you know, where uh, you know, Alzheimer's, what's the point of living, right? Now, the thing is, uh, if you, however, can extend a healthy life to the point where you're able to live to 105 or over, and of course, you're going to look older, you're not going to look like you're 20, right? But the thing is, if you, could, if you have your brain still working, if you could walk, if you could see, if you could hear, well, you know, and you die in your sleep or something like that. I think most people agree that's the way to go. Now, and there's something also you have to be honest with. You have to really throw into this. And that's the, uh, the place of genetics when it comes to longevity. And, you know, year by year, they change the figures around. Sometimes they say it's 60 percent. And in other words, genetics account for 60 percent of extended longevity. Oh, the next year, it's 2 percent. Then it's 30 percent. They can't seem to make up their minds. My, per my personal belief is this. And I've studied this. If you look at the people that live to, let's say, 110, right? They are what I call genetic mutants because they have uh, things in their cell. To make a long story short, they have uh, excellent DNA repair mechanisms. In other words, if you could, it's again related to the trees. They're basically repairing their cells over and over again. That allows them. And, and they also, because of uh, other things, they avoid the major killer diseases cancer and cardiovascular disease. If you can avoid those two, you have a much greater chance of living past 90 because those are the two greatest killers. Now, now there's another way of looking at it too. You mentioned IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one. You're probably familiar with the fact that in animals, animals that are born with lacking either IGF-1 receptors or if they're lacking growth hormone activity, for, for example, snail dwarf mice, they live sometimes twice as long as other mice. And, and they traced it to this lack of IGF-1 activity. IGF-1, some scientists associate with cancer, you know, because it's a, a my, it stimulates mitosis, cell division. They have to think, though, that, that people overlook. Now, you can't do, you know, people will, will, will hear that and say, well, all right, there's the answer. All we have to do is knock out growth hormone or IGF-1 
and we make it to 90. Here's the problem, because, and here's what they overlook, and this is my beef with scientists, by the way. Many scientists, there's a guy named Andre something, uh, he starts with a B, he's out of Illinois. He always writes articles about how growth hormone is very bad for you. You want to have, as you get older, the less growth hormone, the greater the chance of it. And it's all based 100% on animal research. 100%, right? I've read his papers and I, you know, I actually wrote to him and he didn't answer me because I pointed out to him, I said, all right, I understand what you're saying, but isn't it also true that insulin-like growth factor one is needed to maintain neurons? It's exactly. needed to maintain cardiac myocytes. It's exactly. needed to maintain connective tissue. So if you don't have uh, IGF-1 and growth hormone, the body degenerates. So even if you live a long time, you're screwed. You have no brain, you have heart disease. Heart disease. Walk. What's the point? What's the point? I'd rather die early and be able to think and walk and see, fuck, I don't care about the uh, living to 100, being a vegetable. What we're, good is We're huh? exactly on the same page. I, I was hoping you were going to say that. They're going to get brain uh, degeneration, atrophy of the brain, and they're going to get heart disease anyway. Right. But by the way, I have a defective IGF-1 receptor gene. So mm -hmm. I... Yeah, I do. But unfortunately, it's not shown to be uh, um, life extending in males in the centenarian studies, just in females. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. The one from uh, Mount Sinai in New York. I know. I know. I know. Uh, Mir, uh, Mir Barzilai. Right. Exactly. That's true. Unfortunate. You're right. That is and that, that's terrible. I mean, think about <laughs> it. if you were a woman. We're talking about you'd live to a, at least probably at least a hundred years old. I know, and and I can't gain muscle, but I can't live a long time. So it's just. <laughs> Whereas my wife has a fully functioning IGF-1 receptor gene, and you know, and and this is it's not just the IGF-1 receptor gene; it's also the growth hormone receptor. Because I'm sure you've heard of the dwarfs in um, Ecuador or the Laron syndrome dwarfs. They have a deficiency in the uh, in the in the growth hormone receptor gene. They never get cancer, supposedly. Yeah, they don't die of cancer. And they, interestingly, they're fat, but they don't get diabetes, which is fascinating. But you know what their number one cause of death is? Yeah. Cardiac disease. Oh, really? But yeah. Well, but on average, they still... I thought their number one cause of death, and this is a little... Is actually like road accidents and stuff like that. They get run over a lot. They have a lot of mishaps. I'm sure they do. But, but uh, if it's a physical cause, it's cardiovascular disease because... The, exactly. the growth hormone activity does protect them from the cancer and the cardiovascular, but I mean, uh, the cancer and the diabetes. Unfortunately, you still get that degeneration of the, the cardiac tissue as they get older. So if it's a physical cause, it's always cardiovascular, usually congestive heart failure or something like that. Gary, this has been such a fascinating discussion. I'm very aware of your time. I want to ask you one more question and maybe... I keep going. It's okay. I'm not, I'm not doing anything. Okay. Well, one other question. Okay. Before we get to that, then I wanted to ask briefly about statins. What is your feeling? A statin is a very controversial subject, especially in the bodybuilding world. Um, some people take them prophylactically. Like you mentioned, David Sinclair, he does take them prophylactically. Um, of course, everyone knows the concern with statins is that although they're maybe the only cardiovascular medication shown to dramatically reduce, uh, I mean, improve mortality, they also, we know, lead to calcification of the arteries, which you mentioned earlier, and they interfere with some vitamin-related uh, issues. How do you feel about the use of statins? Do you personally use them prophy prophylactically or otherwise? You're talking about statin drugs that you're talking about? Yeah, like like uh, pr privastatin and, uh, you know. Right. The big problem with them is, uh, is twofold. First of all, uh, they interfere with a, uh, a pathway, the mevenolate pathway, uh, which produces cholesterol in the liver. They interfere with HMG-CoA reductase, which is the rate-limiting uh, enzyme for uh, reduction of uh, cholesterol from saturated fat. Uh, they interfere. That's how they work. But that same pathway also produces coenzyme Q10, a nutrient from a precursor of tyrosine, the amino acid, and when you have a, a lack of coenzyme Q10, unfortunately, when, you involve, when you're involved in exercise, you, you tend to uh, have uh, a lot of excessive muscle breakdown. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, statins are very bad for somebody involved in exercise because they, inter they also interfere. I have studies that show they directly interfere with muscle protein synthesis, which, as you know, is the cornerstone for muscle hypertrophy or growth. So statins are a terrible drug to take, uh, you know, if you're involved in exercise. They are terrible, and there's no way around it. You can take coenzyme Q10, and that will kind of lower it a little bit. Some studies say it has no effect, 
the more recent studies say it does have an effect. So I would go with the, uh, and saying, you know, take at least maybe, they'd say 30 uh, milligrams. I say 100 a day minimal if you're on statins. On the other hand, uh, you know, if you can avoid statins, let me give you the bottom line, my opinion. I, I have ne never taken statins and I never would. But, you know, if you can avoid them, avoid them at all costs. However, for people that are fat, lazy, refuse to exercise, eat badly, they have no choice. It's either statins or death. Mm -hmm. now, that's the only thing from uh, keeping them from succumbing for, to, uh, let's say, a heart attack or stroke. For them, there's no choice. And do you recommend, in terms of co coenzyme Q10, do you like the brand MitoQ? You've seen probably a lot of research from them, right? MitoQ is supposedly, uh, the deal with that is, uh, you know, coenzyme Q10 works in the mitochondria. And it, uh, it supposedly helps to protect the mitochondria as an antioxidant. Uh, and uh, the problem is that the, the theory is that normal, uh, of course, you know, there's two forms of regular Q10, ubiquinone and ubiquinone. You know, and, and uh, I, uh, I'm probably mispronouncing it, but I think it's the ubiquinone one supposedly has at least seven times greater absorption. It's recommended for people who are over 40 because it's harder to convert the ubiquinone, ubiquinone into you. I, I can't, I'm getting the mispronounces right. Yeah. But, but you know, my point being that one of them is superior to the other. And the, the deal with MitoQ is that uh, the normal, any form of normal coenzyme Q10, not only is it extremely hard to absorb under any circumstance, it's probably one of the hardest nutrients to absorb. Very hard. You have, you have to take it with a good amount of fat or forget it. It passes right through you. A lot of people don't realize. Take it with a glass of water. It's useless. Unless you take it a water-soluble form. They do make that. Uh, the MitoQ supposedly can enter the uh, mitochondria more efficiently. And because of that, it has tremendous actions in the mitochondria, which you know could be related to improved mitochondria biogenesis, uh, maintenance of mitochondria. Uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, there's a, what's that term uh, the autophagy, um, uh, where the mitochondria themselves undergo autophagy? There's a certain term. Mitochondrial right? biogenesis? No, that's the development of pneuma. But there's a term where the mitochondria basically have the ability to get rid of older mitochondria. Uh, oh. like, it's a certain uh, term, but I can't remember it all. Damaging time. mechanism? Yeah, yeah, exactly. They can detect their own damage and get rid of them so it doesn't interfere with cellular uh, work. Uh, supposedly, uh, this form of mito, mito Q will, will affect that also. However, uh, you know, the studies I've seen that shown it to be effective are unfortunately all sponsored by the company that makes it. And, you know, I've been writing on science for years and, I, and, I, and let me put it this way. I wouldn't completely discount a company sponsored study because somebody's got to pay for it. Yeah. On the other hand, they do have an ax to grind. In other words, if yeah. they could show positive results from this study and they put in their advertising, you know, people will say, well, uh, scientific study shows MitoQ is superior to other coins. I'm people will, intelligent people will say, well, there's a scientific study, must be, must be good. They don't look right beyond the, the, uh, the shield and see who, who paid for the study. Most people just say it was published in a legitimate journal, it must be real, and they assume it's real. And they buy it now, you know, but the problem is that, again, you got to be a little suspicious because anything, you know, that's a company sponsored, you know, a study, they're always going to try and veer it. And, you know, if you know how studies are put together, there's ways of manipulating studies to get the results you want, like choosing bad placebos, uh, not choosing enough of another substance to compare it with. There's many ways to manipulate studies to get the result you want. So, you know, my point is, when I have seen independent and are one or two independent studies of MitoQ, they haven't shown any superiority to regular coins in Q10. Not that they're bad, but they're not, not any, they're not any better. And it's a lot more expensive. Yeah, uh, it is certainly. If price is no option though, sometimes you can even see, obviously we have a lot of issues with funding and research and particularly with the, from the, like the sugar industry, the, the people like that. But Sometimes in terms of supplements, you can see the, the funding of research to be like a, an indication of the company's seriousness about investing in their product. So sometimes it's less likely that the, at least the product will be underdosed or something like that, you can assume. Additionally, you mentioned another topic, which is study design. I feel like, and this is just sharing notes, I feel like um, in terms of uh, learning about health for one's own use, as well as uh, in the writing about it, the two best skills you can have really is to have an undergrad or a background in, in biochemistry, which you have. I don't, unfortunately don't have that, but I had a background in study design because I used to manage the behavioral research laboratory at the London School of Economics professionally. So I feel like reading research, the most important thing you can have other than subject knowledge 
is an understanding of how to manipulate studies because you can manipulate studies to do all kinds. I mean, I'm, I'm more familiar with social science research professionally, but you can do all kinds of things, you know. Well, you can, that was my point. Exactly. And what you said is valid too. I mean, it's actually, uh, it's actually very good that companies are willing to, uh, to recruit researchers to uh, produce studies about their product uh, because it does show confidence in the product. In other words, they wouldn't pay the money if they uh, had any idea that the product would fail. They have enough confidence in the product. This is another way of looking at it, where it can, it can let's say, uh, pass the test of scientific scrutiny. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, and a lot of them do. A lot of, a lot of these studies actually do prove, you know, and they, they pay a lot of money. These things cost hundreds of thousands of these studies. So, you know, they deserve to be able to use those studies in their advertising. They paid the money, you know, they paid the do. Why not let them use it if, if it turns out to be true? You know, I, 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 do, I do have a policy, though, in my applied metabolics. Honestly, I try to avoid company sponsored studies only because, you know, it just there's a little bit too much. You know, I, I just I've seen a lot of bad studies that were sponsored by companies. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I, I, unless it's a really solid, I have used companies uh, talked about or written about company sponsored studies, but I really scrutinize those studies carefully. I look at all the, uh, you know, the, the nuances of the study, you know, the, the comparisons and, and this and that. And if it's solid, I'll write about it. I, I don't care who paid for it, you know. And viewers, just so you guys know, if you haven't already have read his newsletter, uh, Jerry is very, pers- he also, tr- not only does he try to avoid uh, in vitro studies, but even in vivo studies, he tries to stay away from animal studies. And every time he cites an animal study, he'll write a two sentence prologue saying, this is, you know, don't take this seriously. You know, so he really tries to rely on human studies and he's very um, precise about that. Now, another topic I would like to ask you about is there is a, of course, I know you're a fan of the low carb, high fat uh, lifestyle, which I can understand being genetically predisposed to type 2 diabetes, as I am, by the way, also severely uh, have some of the worst genetics for type 2 diabetes. But um, this community has some interesting thoughts about a variety of matters. One I wanted to bring your attention to here is this concept of polyunsaturated fats being particularly prone to oxidation in the body and consumption of higher amounts of polyunsaturated fats, which are called PUFAs, leading to a, a vulnerability in, in cell membranes that can, lead more, uh, that can lead people to higher rates of developing cardiovascular disease. So do you uh, buy into this uh, idea that it seems to have less um, empirical research? It's more of a theoretical? I would, I, th- there's, there's merit to the idea that polyunsaturated fats are very prone to oxidation. There's, there's a, that is a scientific fact. However, uh, there's an easy remedy to it. You don't, uh, <laughs> just common sense, you want to try and avoid ingesting rancid oils. You can, you know, if you smell, uh, let's say a fish oil product or, well, I'm talking, I use the liquid ones. I, it would be harder to do with capsules, but I mean, if you detect any, any sign of rancidity, rancidity, it should be avoided. They are detrimental to health. However, I feel, and I've seen a lot of tests like Consumer Lab, uh, there's an international fish oil organization that actually tests hundreds and hundreds of commercial fish oil products. And I use fish oil as an example, because that's probably the most of all the oils, uh, in fact, that's the most prone to rancidity of all of them. Mm-hmm. And the International Fish Oil Organization, I think it's called, they test hundreds of commercial varieties and they release the results to the public. It's free. You can go on their site. They will tell you whether they, they, they detected any heavy metals, any detection of oxidation, and so on and so forth. Now, if the, you know, if the product passes that, the odds that it's going to cause problems in the body are zero. In other words, uh, it's not going to cause problems. However, if you are concerned about that, again, there's a simple solution is just to ensure, for example, when you take uh, fish oil, if you're not quite sure of the freshness, this you could take antioxidants, vitamin E, for example, uh, an herb called rosemary is very good for polyunsaturated. And, and there's one, there's a, there's an actual antioxidant called astaxanthin. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah. And that's what gives uh, uh, salmon the pink color and flamingos the pink Flamingo. color. Uh, but it has this uh, kind of weird ability where it can take a rancid uh, fat and convert it back to a fresh fat. I'm not really sure how it does that, but it actually can do that. I mean, if, uh, so, you know, if, if you want to keep a bottle of that around, if you use a lot of fish oil, it might be a good idea 
keep a bottle of Aztec Xanthan. I take it regularly myself, not because I'm afraid of rancid oils, uh, but because I, I think it's a pretty good, it, it actually can bypass the blood brain barrier. And if you know anything about the brain, the brain is composed of a, a large amount of fat, you know, you know, and unfortunately it's a lot of it's polyunsaturated fat. So the fat in your brain can actually go rancid. And when that happens, you have brain degeneration diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and many other diseases, also premature brain aging. So I take a couple of anti, like S, I, I take Axtaxanthin for that purpose alone, because it can get through the blade, blood blade barrier and it, it's very effective at neutralizing, uh, it's something like a hundred times more effective than vitamin C at neutralizing free radicals and reactive oxygen species. So I, t I take it for that reason alone. But the human studies on, I have no idea how to pronounce it, but we're talking about the same thing. The human studies on that have been, I mean, I don't even know of any human studies that show any significant results. And that even the animal studies are sparse, but it's very popular. It seems to have promising research, but it's, is it just a lack of attention, you think, to, to the... I think I've seen some pretty good studies on it. I mean, you know, you're right, they're sparse. But yeah. I've seen human studies. I've seen studies where it increases human muscular endurance. That were pretty solid. I didn't write about them, but they were pretty solid. You know, I mean, uh, I think there's something to it. I, I mean, if you're asking me, would I consider an essential nutrient or, or supplement to take? No, definitely not. I don't think, I mean, for example, if you eat salmon, if you eat foods that can naturally contain it, you probably don't need it. You know, yeah. you don't need it at all. I mean, but you take it before you take something like quercetin or, oh, really? I, I take it, I take it, uh, I take it with uh, usually a, a, any type of fat meal. I take it when I take fish oil. Actually, right now I'm only taking one capsule a day. I take it, I take some fish oil in the morning. I take a 12 milligram capsule of Astex. I only take it once a day right now. Uh, can I ask you a quick side note about fish oil? Do you take the triglyceride form or the uh, ethyl ester form? I'm taking the triglyceride form right now. Right. I use Carlson's uh, liquid, it's a triglyceride form. Uh, actually, if you want to know the truth though, uh, from a brain perspective, you might have heard that DHA, which is one of the uh, uh, essential omega-3 fatty acids, has a tremendous effect on the brain. In mm -hmm. fact, I've seen studies, it's shocking. I mean, I, I believe these were animal studies, but it had some really shocking results showing that you have something like a 78% decreased chance of, of getting Alzheimer's disease if you have uh, enough DHA in the brain. It's very protective. Uh, but the more recent studies show that the phospholipid form of, uh, of uh, let's say omega-3, for example, krill oil, yeah. they brain a lot easier than either the ethyl ester or the uh, triglyceride form. As a result of those studies, I now take krill oil also. I take four capsules a day just to get the faucet, just to make sure, because I'm so convinced of the importance of DHA, I'm completely convinced. Oh, yeah. of, you know, that, that, and not only that, but if you have what they call the Apple E4, if you're, if you're a carrier of that, and you have two genetic variations, your chances of Alzheimer's disease increase by quite a bit, by something like 50, 60. Doesn't mean you're going to get Alzheimer's disease, but it means you're more prone. Now, my mother had, she wasn't autopsy, but I believe she had not Alzheimer's, something called vascular dementia, which is caused by a long-term hypertension, high blood pressure, which she had had for many years. My father never got any kind of dementia. He died of say, diabetic complications. I do not know if I have two genes for apolipoprotein E4, but just to be safe, I, I, I came across a study showing that the phospholipid form of omega-3, such as krill oil, bypasses the problem of apolipid 4 So it actually protects people who do have the gene. So in other words, if you think, if you have anyone in your family, uh, grandmother, grand, something like that, who, who had, you think might have had Alzheimer's, it might be a good idea to start something with a little krill oil. You know, more very hurt. absolutely right. This is a very fascinating uh, stream of research showing the DHA's effect on the APOE4 uh, variant carrying people. By the way, Jerry, you know that the APOE4 carrying variant also affects sleep a lot. And I know you have issues with sleep and you're always focused on your sleep because there's sort of a, a weird um, um, a positive feedback loop with Alzheimer's disease and sleep where AD makes it harder to sleep and then sleep makes it makes the uh, accumulation of, you know. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I worry about that together. In the last uh, couple of months, I've had very disordered sleep. Uh, and I know the reason though, I know the reason I found out, but uh, it's very, very bad for your brain. And, uh, you know, just one night of uh, 
I mean, I'm trying to get the exact figure. It was very scary. One night of not enough sleep, let's say four hours, increases the deposition of a protein called tau. There's two proteins associated with Alzheimer's. One is beta amyloid 42. The other one's called tau, T-A-U. One night of lack of sleep increases tau deposition in the brain by as much as 20 to 30 percent. That scared the hell out of me because my sleep has been very bad. I will, you know, I take things to help me, natural things, melatonin, a couple of natural herbs to help me sleep. But unfortunately, I often wake up an hour or two after I fall asleep and I come wide awake and it's just been very bad. But I do know the reason. I have what they call sleep apnea. I have sleep oh. apnea. And I believe, and I, I kind of pieced it together because I, I said to myself, now, not only do I wake up after an hour or two of sleep, but when I wake up, you know, I'm wide awake. Like a, it's as if I suddenly had six cups of coffee. I'm not, gr- I'm wide awake. I'm thinking, how can I be awake? And then I realized it's a surge of, ep- uh, of catecholamines because what I've done is I've stopped breathing my body responded by going to a stress syndrome. It kicks out the catecholamines and, you know, fight or flight. They wake you up like, like, like forget about it. And, and, you know, it's all related to sleep apnea. The problem is now with this pandemic, I had a sleep study, a sleep study done recently. And they showed that I stopped breathing seven times uh, in the, and I only slept for an hour because they, they had me come in at 9 p.m. I'm a night person. I don't fall asleep before 5 a.m. And I couldn't fall asleep. I took all my sleep stuff with me. I still could not fall asleep. And when I fell asleep at 4 a.m. and they woke me up at 5 a.m., I only slept one hour. But in that one hour period, they said I stopped breathing seven times, which to me confirms the sleep apnea. They already knew I had it. The next step is to have what they call a CPAP device or something like that. I can't have it done because of this. The doctors aren't seeing anyone. They're only doing tele, uh, you know, telehealth conferences on the phone or something, you know, of not computer, but on the phone. So I have to wait. In the meantime, I'm still getting this waking up thing. And, and I, I, to be honest, Leo, I'm terrified of what it's doing to my brain. Your because brain and heart also, yeah. I take a bunch of stuff to help my brain. I take a couple of smart drugs. Hopefully, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I do it mainly for my writing to help, you know, make me. That's my main question. That's the next one. And maybe the last question. I do that to increase my focus and concentrate. I'm not trying to make myself smart or anything like that. But the point being that, that, I am worried, and quite frankly, you might have noticed in this conversation, there's a couple of instances where I forgot words I was trying to remember. That scares me because that is not me. Usually I'm very good at word recall. The fact that I'm having trouble recalling certain words, that to me is a little very worrisome to me because it, and I, I could be jumping to conclusions, but you know, they say it's normal for somebody my age, but I'm normally very good at word recall. When I'm writing, I always have recall. I never forget words, but for some reason in conversation lately, I've noticed I have trouble recalling certain words. I think it's related to the, the sleep problems I'm having. It really may be. And that is, of course, the first sign. That's what people should be watching out for. And by the way, I used to suffer from sleep apnea quite severely because I had a, like a 22-inch neck uh, for some wow. reason. And I, I used to use a CPAP uh, as well. And unfortunately, it's very unpleasant to use, but it really tremendously changed. I mean, you can immediately wow. feel the difference. The yeah. Yeah, the inflammation in your body, you can, you feel it like you feel younger immediately. Excellent. Right. Well, yeah, it's, it's a huge difference. I, I really hope you, you, get, you get to use it. Looks like I'm going to have to get it. I have no choice. Otherwise, it's going to get worse and worse. Another side note, have you read the research on the RevHerb agonists that are called SR9009 and SR9011? And if you haven't, I'd be glad to send you the research, but it's very interesting. In the bodybuilding community right now, and I had no idea bodybuilders were doing this because I came across the reverb stuff from my studies on sleep because I also, like you, was a night person and I was, of course, I had sleep apnea and I, I, I was realizing that the sleep thing is damaging my brain. So I got very into it. Anyway, I came across uh, this, basically there's uh, some agonists of the rev herb uh, gene in the body that affect how, um, how uh, mice, uh, basically what they've done with mice, and I'm trying to re- uh, get a researcher on the channel to interview him because I'm, I have some questions about the research, but basically they've taken rodents, given them these agonists of rev herb, uh, alpha and beta, and what they do is they give it to the rodent in the middle of their sleeping time. The rodent completely awakens, but some interesting thing happens. Number one, they have an anxiolytic effect without uh, and without a, a drowsiness. They're not made to be drowsy, which usually c- comes along with having less anxiety. 
Uh, they also have done some heart operations. They've, they've induced heart attacks in the rodents and given them the agonists and they recover much quicker. They've also done uh, surgery, like some kind of surgery on the cardiac uh, muscle and they recover much quicker with one injection, once. They also have, um, seems to be curing some kind of colitis in the rodents. Uh, I mean, it's just unbelievable. Basically what it happened, what it does, it seems to do, and they've also tried it on older rodents. What it seems to do is this, as you get older, your circadian rhythm seems to flatten out. So that in the daytime, you're not as awake. And at night, you're more awake than you used to be. And when you're asleep, you're not as asleep. And it seems to be that injections of the SR9001 and SR9, whatever they are, uh, injections of them in the daytime will cause an older person to be completely awake. And it may make it more likely to be able to sleep later. They may force the circadian rhythm back into, uh, you know, more of a rhythm. So it's, I tried, I'll try to send you some research uh, through email. Are these peptides? I'm not, I'm not that familiar with this. Uh, they're being sold as research chemicals on those websites, but um, in, it, they're not really that useful, those ones, because it would have to be injected subcutaneously, I would assume, and the people are taking them orally, but the mount mice were all injected with it. Uh, but the research, uh, just remember Rev Herb Agonist, and you'll find it's REV-ERB, you'll find some crazy literature. It's, it's really promising, really promising. Okay, so one of the most important things I want to ask you about, and now I'm, 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 I'm aware this has gone a little bit long, but last question is that, so I've actually asked you this a long time ago through email, I think, but what, what I, so one of the main focuses of my channel is cognitive enhancement. There's a new term that's come about lately. It's very fashionable, but personally, I, for a long time, you know, I was always interested in how I could manipulate my physical fitness, but moreover, my mental fitness, because, um, you know, you, you like, you are fortunate to have good, good word recall, even into your age. And I, as a child, couldn't remember what I, what I did last week. I, my whole life has been like that. Unfortunately, that happens sometimes to children who go through stressful experiences. Their uh, hippocampus doesn't form properly. So I've had a bunch of issues with memory, and I've been researching a lot of compounds to improve my thinking. Now, what the audience may not know is Jerry is very into this as well. I think maybe he's one of the most expert people on the subject. So I wanted to ask, what compounds are you most into for this purpose? And are there particular neurotransmitters that you're interested in? For example, the cholinergic system or the serotonergic system. We've, we've learned lately that the serotonin, serotonergic system has some effects on, on uh, memory as well. How, how do you think of, how do you go about it yourself? Well, I, I, uh, I actually manipulate all the neurotransmitters through different mechanisms. <laughs> uh, um, uh, for example, when I'm writing, I use a number of racetams. You're probably familiar with the racetams. The original was paracetam. Yeah. I, uh, I can't even pronounce it. Aracetam, I think it's called. Aniracetam. Yeah, I use that. Uh, I use the, the, the uh, what is it called? The, the, oh, I'd have to look at it, so I don't even remember it. I know it sounds funny. I'm talking about cognitive things. I can't remember the name. No, they're hard to pronounce, those things. And nobody reads them. Once you have it, you just stay. <laughs> well, the, the bottom line is I, I use, let me see. I use uh, one, two. I use three different racetams. I don't take them all at once. I alternate them. Yeah. I also use this stuff called, um, oh, God, what's it, the, the powder? Uh, I can't remember. This little powder stuff. Uh, I can't remember the name of it either. It, it's a little powder. I let, it's a sublingual thing I put under my tongue. It's a hey, racetam? It's not a racetam. It's this other stuff. Oh, I can't. Uh, anyway, but I alternate. That's the point. And I only, I only use these when I'm writing because I don't, I kind of like, I feel if I take them all the time, they're not going to work after a while. So mm -hmm. uh, when I'm not actually writing or researching, I don't use them. I, I don't take anything. I just take my normal supplements. But what I found when I use them is they definitely increase my focus and concentration where I could write. Like I say, it really increases my word recall. I found it a great asset for writing and it, it gives me very clear thinking too. I, I very clearly, I, I don't, uh, I, I don't get the so-called senior moments or anything like that. Uh, if I was on it now, talking to you, I probably would not have had any problem with re re word recall. That's uh, what, yeah. And like I say, I take, I don't take large amounts. Uh, according to the scientific studies, people that study this stuff will tell you that they only work if you uh, already have something wrong with your brain. In other words. If you have normal brain function, according to the so-called experts, like at USC, a couple of the guys, the neurological uh, experts, they've looked at these things. They say they only could possibly help people that already have uh, brain damage to a certain extent to begin with. 
my feeling is that uh, anybody who's past a certain age is already showing, like you mentioned, uh, we, we talk about you know the lack of that's min minimal cognitive impairment that they call it. And I'm showing a little sign to that, like I say, you know, and I think that you know you take this stuff, you have that. I think it's enough. Those drugs are enough to actually offset that because I don't have any impairment when I'm on these things. None. I never. I think we all have a bit of mild cognitive impairment by even 30. Well, listen, any kind of stress, it's known fact in, uh, in science that if you're under stress, you're going to have a minimal. I don't care if you're 20 Apoptosis years old. of the neurons, yeah. No, you, you're going to have, it seem like you're 60, 70 years old. You're going to have trouble remembering things. Any kind of stress, like I say, go without sleep. You could be 20 years old. You're going to also be, you know, having, having trouble thinking. It can happen. So I use them for that purpose. Uh, I don't, I'm not like the, I mean, there's various forums and stuff where people rave about this stuff and they try and give attributes to it, which I don't quite agree with. And, and my biggest problem with these guys is that somehow they have this idea. If you take, let's say a couple of racetams or this other stuff I'm talking about, that it'll take a, a person of normal intelligence, just like that movie. Uh, what was it called? Uh, uh, yeah. I, I, what was the name of it? Was it limitless? Was that anything? Limitless, exactly. You know, we took a pill. He was just kind of this average, dull guy. He couldn't complete a novel. He was worried. Then he takes this uh, experimental pill, and, he, and he, he writes the novel in a day, and he learns six languages. I mean, these, these people seem to think that this stuff actually does that, and it doesn't. It doesn't. I, I have a drug I have here. I have a bottle of it. Uh, what the hell is it called? What's that famous one? Uh, damn, it's right here. Hold on a second. Hold on. <laughs> Go ahead. This is probably the most famous so-called smart drug. I'm sure you've heard of it. Can you see it? Modafinil. Modafinil, of course. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See this bottle here? I, I bought this bottle three years ago. Three years ago. And I'm going to show you something. I've never opened it. Oh, Modafinil is uh, no joke. It's a, it's a useful I, thing. I know. I've never taken this drug. It, Why? Because I'll tell you why, because I wasn't having sleep problems when I got this stuff, but the mere fact that, you know, I, I've, always had a, I've always had sleep problems to the extent that I have insomnia, probably because of the asthma drugs I have to take. I always have trouble going to sleep for years. I mean, 20 years I've had this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, like I say, I have to take, uh, you know, I take melatonin, a couple of things to help me sleep. I did a video of what the things I take, but when I did this research on modafinil, most of the research indicates it really is effective. I mean, it sharpens your memory. Uh, your, I mean, this is probably very useful for me, but I'm so worried that there'd be an overlap effect where it affect my already bad sleep where I'd be up all night on this stuff. It so, certainly will because of the, the it, it will still be in your system at nighttime in, in a little I've bit. I've read that. I've read, yeah. I've read people who've used it. The biggest complaint was that it gave them insomnia over and over again. I've seen they It'll, said it. Definitely helped my thinking ability, but it gave me, it's, I've seen 30, 40 people saying this. So I said to myself, well, uh, even though that's anecdotal, I, you know, I don't want to take a chance. So I have this bottle and I said to myself, the only time I'll ever use this, if there's ever an occasion where I have, where I have, I have no sleep at all, but I have to get up early and do something intellectual, that's when I'll take one. But I haven't taken one yet. <laughs> as a specular, I have to tell you, as a speculator, I'm almost completely certain that it will reduce your deep sleep. And, and that's, the, that's a huge concern. I, I already have a problem with that, so I can't take much. And more. also modafinil, you know, originally people thought that it didn't affect like norepinephrine and the transmission of some of, the, uh, the, um, some of these uh, neurotransmitters. But it turns out it does. There's recent studies that show that they affect them. I think... Um, I'm not sure if it causes uh, transmission of the neurotransmitters or inhibits the reuptake. I can't remember now, but I did a video on it. Uh, also, so you don't you don't take any like uh, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, like uh, natural ones. Ginkgo. I take uh, hopazine A. Oh, okay. Oh, wow, great. I also take something called black seed oil. Uh, black seed oil, which is a natural uh, inhibitor of acetylcholinesterase. A lot of people don't know that, but it's a natural. I take that. So. I, I can say I take two natural forms. I yeah, that probably is a good idea for... for Opusine A, actually, I found out something recently, which I didn't know. Did you know that it helps to clear out heavy metals in the brain? I didn't know that. I didn't know that myself. I just found out. It actually has that secondary effect. Not only does it inhibit acetylcholesterase, which increases acetylcholine in the hippocampus, you know, in the thinking, learning area, 
but it also clears out some, let's say you've accumulated some heavy metals, it helps your brain clear them out somehow. Do you feel a great anxiolytic effect from huperzine? Uh, Is it I, very mild? Very mild, very mild. I take 200 micrograms once a day in the, when, I, when I first wake up. And uh, I don't really, if it's there, I honestly don't notice it. I don't notice it. So you, so you don't think it's, um, so, okay, good. Because I was, I was uh, cautious about using it because I thought it may downregulate GABA receptors or serotonin, which I expect is what. Not that I know, but it, it, the thing that you have to remember about it, which I, I really should be more conscious of, it has a very long half-life, very long. You don't need to take it every day. You actually, if you're going to take it once every two days, it would still be a pretty good amount in your body. And I, I take it every day, so I'm probably overdoing it. And you can tell you're getting too much. It's a weird side effect because it, it's, it, you get this uh, uh, abundance of acetyl uh, uh, choline, and the first thing you notice is a stiff neck. Your, your neck is going to feel real stiff, and you're going to get headaches. That's a sign that you've got too much acetyl choline from the Hooper A. I learned that over the years. Fascinating. Yeah. That is such an interesting tip. I never knew that. Um, okay, I could talk to you. With, uh, you know, I could. <laughs> Jerry is such a wealth of information. I've really, I've rarely spoken to someone with wow, the breadth of information. And there's so many things I want to talk to you. I hope I can. Uh, hopefully, we can promote the video a little bit and try to get uh, some views. And then, because you know, on your channel, you're always talking more of, on a straight t- line on one topic. So maybe I'll be able to convince you to come back again, and we could talk about more more subjects. Absolutely. I enjoy talking to you. It's nice to talk to somebody who understands everything I say. It's rare, you know? I mean, most people, they, what? What's that? Huh? What? You know, they don't know what I'm talking about. No, I'm very fortunate. I'm honored to have had you, Jerry. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll end it here, and I'll send you an email with the, that link about the Rev Herb Agonist, because that really may be something promising. I'd like to take a look at that. Sure, absolutely. Hey, thank you so much, Jerry. Have a great day. Bye-bye.